Good morning and welcome to the Jesus in Jiu Jitsu podcast. This is episode 072. My name is Isaac Tawaefa and I am here with Josh Strasberger. Not JP Denell. Not. Not JP. Not Lucas Pickard. Yeah. Welcome, my friends. What's up, homie? Welcome to the podcast. No. Oh. Good it's, to see you this It's morning. great to be here. This is the first time I've been allowed back on since the Finger Guns episode. Mm hmm. Yeah. No, Don't it's push not. your luck. <laughs> no, it's not. This <laughs> no. is the second time. Second Don't time, push yeah. your luck. <laughs> Keep them holstered. Keep them holstered. Today, <laughs> finger guns are actual gun. nope. I'd probably kill <laughs> you, but I wouldn't want to. <laughs> <sighs> uh, well, as soon as you're done throwing up in your car, yeah. This morning, um, <laughs> yeah. People are screaming into their dashboard. Right They're now. like, I thought Josh was better than this. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to draw me in. Yeah. I will maintain the peace. Pew pew. I want to. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, wanna, so it's good to be here with no, you guys. Don't wrist lock me on, on film. Uh, on yeah. ca- film. On film. Phil, how old are you? What is this? The 1980s on, film. Yeah. On um, Isaac, gosh, are you old enough called? to have ever owned a VHS? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, dude. Are you old enough to have ever purchased a VHS with your own money? Yes. Be kind. Rewind. You know. That's blockbuster. I know. I remember, and I thought it was so cool that my what I what I would consider when I was young uh-huh. for someone to be rich was they had one of those fast rewinding machines. He could put it in there, close it, and it was like, bzzz, sure. You know, but like that doesn't answer the question. Like, what VHS tape did you buy with your own money? Well, I don't know if I bought it with my own money. That I remember the getting them, like, that, that was the specific yeah. question, and you were like, and yes. You went and now you're like, rental. No, I got them as <laughs> gifts. I, I don't think I actually used my own money to buy them. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no. For yeah. like, Six months and then it was phased out. Yeah, no. pretty much. So uh, I remember VHS. You had a DVD had, player already. No, 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 your, no, no. I had a whole collection of VHS tapes and uh, We're Back. Remember that Disney movie? The Dinosaurs? Angels in the Outfield. I remember Angels in the Outfield. outfield yeah, yes. Classic. We're Back, I don't know. It was probably yeah. off of... It was a cool... It's a really like old Disney movie. Um, so the only... Dinosaur movie. Robin Hood is a ex- really old Disney movie. The only acceptable dinosaur <laughs> movie would be Land Before Time. 100%. Oh yeah, of course. Um, yep. Yeah, respect. So it was still in the puffy case. Yeah, it was a cool, yeah. unique movie. Like I, that, we're back. We're back. Yeah, yeah. It, it was about these dinosaurs. This this professor goes back into, and I'm sure you guys want to hear this. Um, that are listening right now. Hey, uh, <laughs> I steered it away from finger guns. No, this professor goes. We might need to go back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't I, remember I, the. I may the, pull out my real gun and yeah. The good professor's name, but he had a he had a brother that was named Professor Screw Eye, and he was like really evil. Anyway, this guy goes back and he gives this brain grow cereal to these cereal. Yeah. Okay. To these uh, dinosaurs. Right. He goes back in time. He gives the. And gives then the, the dinosaurs they, the brain yeah. grow cereal, and then they get like uh, their you know their brain like develops, and they have um, they're like sentient. They can, he can like talk to them and whatever, and they have personalities and stuff. Yeah. And then they get they somehow end up in New York City. And okay, yeah, huh? Nineteen ninety three. Okay, yeah. yep. So not real old. Nope, not okay. real old. I was uh, four. So okay, IMDb gives it a six out of ten. Ooh, stellar. Rotten Tomatoes gives it 38%. Oh. Rotten Tomatoes. Four fun-loving <coughs> dinosaurs take a trip to New York City, courtesy of Captain New Eyes, Walter Cronkite. Uh, yeah. Good old Walter. Yeah, he's a great the time-traveling yeah. alien. Cronkite time-traveling alien mm-hmm. is oh intent on bringing some joy to the children of the Big Apple. That's right. I mean... Do you remember? The T-Rex is John Goodman, so yeah. it's got that going for it. Dude, it, it oh, was nice. awesome. It sounds like it's got some good voice acting. Yeah. 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 I, You know what would have stopped those dinosaurs dead in their tracks? No. <laughs> I bet you do. A comet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, Sharp tooth. So, oh, man. Yeah, anyway, so I did good. own a bunch of VHSs. Mm-hmm. Um, but before I forget, like oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to do... Um, I do want to give some love and respect, give a shout out to our sponsor for today's episode, which is Yoakum Signature Hot Rods. Ooh, yes. yeah. yeah. In Sunbury, Kyle North Carolina. Yoakum. Kyle Yoakum. Kyle Yoakum is the we man. We got some good Kyle Yoakum, Yoakum Signature Hot Rod gear. Yeah. Me yeah, too. We got a yeah. little onesie for the baby. Oh, so awesome. really? Nice. Yeah. I love mm. it, man. Um, so they, Yoakum Signature Hot Rods specializes in metal shaping and body and paint work on antique vehicles. Um, we talked a lot about 
them on our podcast. If you want to go check them out, you can check them out at yokumsrodshop.com and also at yokumsrodshop on Instagram. Uh, spell yokum for us. Y O C U M. Yeah. Yep. Not like Dwight. Not nah. like Dwight. No, we do like Dwight, but he's not bad. A lot of fringe. Yeah. A whole lot of fringe and yeah. way too much suede. Yeah. I wonder if Kyle Yokum likes Dwight Yokum. I don't know. I don't know. Kyle, text me. Let yeah, me know. Let us know, <laughs> Kyle. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for sponsoring this episode. Thank You're you welcome. to Jocko Fuel as well. Yeah. So. Yep, yep. Uh, Josh got a little bit of joint warfare before we, yeah, I need we a got little, going with my, this. His, he's having some hippie issues. Geriatric hips yeah. today are... Isaac, you you haven't gotten this yet, but after 35, mm -hmm. uh, most men in America catch uh, a case of OLD, and uh -huh. then we just like <laughs> fight it for the rest of our lives. Yes. So, yes. I got but, it in my left knee, but and you know slowly getting just it in wait. other parts. But yep. Just wait. I'm a couple. When it, yeah. when it infects the IT bands, that's when you're like, oh, this is over. <laughs> I legitimately asked. I was like, is this what arthritis feels like? Yep. That's uh, what. <laughs> so I got arthritis in a couple places, but. Thankfully, not you know, it's not as prevalent as like really you know super old people like you guys. But I think that uh, jujitsu though, I think jujitsu is like jujitsu is it has this kneading process. Like I'm getting like rolled. K N E E D. Yes. Yes. All right. Yeah. Where where like like dough. You are forced to stay limber because your body's just getting bent. And That's going to change and, for yeah. you too. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm I'm just hoping to stay pliable by getting beat up beat up so often they just force me pliable yeah and then i feel it the just, next day. just like tear your hamstrings i'm not and trying to just, talk y'all out of it in a like a stretch but. armstrong yeah. you just like slowly yeah. just like yeah. everything yeah. comes in. stretch armstrong was a toy yeah. Yeah. i know i know I, yeah. know I do do you yes. know who teddy rooks rupskin is oh bro it sounds so familiar you to remember me. the doodle bear <laughs> What? This is what just a else? classic. Yeah, no joke. No, like my era of toys was like the it was cassette sock and tapes. boppers. Did you have cassette tapes? You didn't have cassette yeah, tapes. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I had a Walkman. Oh. It was my dad's old Walkman. <laughs> it was a yellow um Oh, that's Walkman. a classic. Yeah. 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 yeah those one. those like the one. shockproof one, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so and, you could drop it. Yeah. And those little headphones that had like the little metal slider with the plastic oh, earbuds. Could, yeah, and the, they were kind of flat. The foam all over them. <laughs> yeah. tear, and the foam would rip off and then it was yeah. just metal on your ear. Yes, yeah. dude. That's good stuff. Um Yeah, man. That was, anyway, that was good. Jocko Fuel. Yes. Uh you guys got a couple of blue razzes here blue with Jocko Raz. Fuel. Uh so these are the Jocko Goes Clean Energy Drinks. You can, uh, yeah, go to JockoFuel.com, use code JJJ10, save you 10%, and that 10%, it saves you, there you go, goes towards uh, helping out the ministry of Jesus and Jiu-Jitsu. And so helping we, yourself. Yes. The 10% doesn't go to helping yourself, but the <laughs> other 90 does. So, mm. yeah, because when you get your product, that will help yourself. But 10% yeah. off. 10% off. Yeah. So... Double so it's help. a double, double whammy. You get double a great whammy. product, and you get to get it for cheaper. Double it helps impact. the ministry. It's a triple mm, whammy. Double dribble. <laughs> that was yes. a Nintendo I think it's when game. You, I think it's when you drool from both sides of your mouth. It's a double dribble, like when mm -hmm. you're teething. Yeah. That mm -hmm. was me last episode. When yeah, Levi's getting over. his uh, his two-year molars right now. Oh, yeah. So we're dealing with all, oh, the, no. all the teething. Everywhere. But it's different. Though. It's like, like when he got his front teeth, it wasn't that bad because he could just like chew on something. But now, yeah, in order to get that back. relief, it's got to go all the way to the back. So I'm talking this joker when in the middle of the night when we're trying to put him down, instead of just like getting a little like nibble bite, we're like, oh, you pinch me, jerk. <laughs> now, like you can feel it coming because the mouth will open and he'll just start Work like his working his you. way out. Yeah. Like, bro, don't do this. This is going to end poorly your for arm everybody. Or your finger or what? Just arm. You know what it was the other night was, uh, and I would, I would show you, but I got headphones on. It was my ear. <laughs> And I didn't know, like I was dozing in the TV bed. on your ear. Yeah, I was dozing in the in the in the bed with him, and just kind of going to sleep. Or I was putting him down. He was having a rough night, and then I woke up to a chomp on my ear oh. that drew blood. Yeah. And Kirsten's in the other room with a screaming baby, and so I'm like, I can't. Like I'm not gonna go get mom. Yeah. But I'm gonna put you in the bed. I'm putting a little guardrail up so you don't fall out, and Dad's just gonna sit in the chair. And we're not going to talk for a couple of minutes until I get all of my crap together 
I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it in a box. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to take everything on that box and put it on that shelf that lies in the middle of every man's chest (laughs) where all the anger is. And that one day somebody's going to knock that shelf over and you biting me in the ear, they're going to get that. It's going to come out. And you're going to have a... But you're you're not tonight. (laughs) Dude, it's not you. It's it's a tough time when they they start teething, man. You get... It's a... It's... For my daughter... All my kids woke up like... 10 times throughout the night, every time yeah. they were teething. And it yeah, was just we, hard to comfort we them. We found this stuff called... Uh, Highland? No. Teething tablets? Ooh. No, we... Whiskey? This, they're, they're chamomile <laughs> the drops, and I forget oh. I forget what they're called. But man, they for Levi, they were amazing whenever he first started yeah. teething. Um, because like it's just... And I've tried them. It, it's nothing. Right, it tastes like nothing, uh, but it's just enough chamomile to kind of like numb Calm their mouths them and like out. calm them down. Oh, it it was phenomenal. And you can give them, I think, like up to twelve of these little like, and it's oh. like three or four drops in yeah. these things, so they just suck them down. Yep. You can give them like up to twelve of them a day. It doesn't do anything. Doesn't bother their stomach. And they're like, yeah, just as long as you do it like fifteen minutes apart, to make sure it's effective. Bro, they were they were great. Those days are so forgotten now. My my. <laughs> in-laws my mother-in-law and father-in-law were here for the fourth um and they brought my nephew yeah and um he's potty trained but like they're in the phase of him teaching him how to wipe himself oh and like we're we're all sitting at the table and the kids are there too and they were like how old was i when i and I have no recollection yeah, of no that clue. Yeah. training Jen phase. like knows dates no likely. she doesn't no, either she she's yeah. like yeah. it's been long enough like don't remember like i know uh-huh. we went through well, that that's, that's like, god's kindness to you that he would allow you to forget <laughs> no dude joke. because i'm telling you like <laughs> i'm not looking forward to no, it. it yeah <laughs> it's it, but well and you but just once it's done that. yeah <laughs> and i'm not looking forward to that and then the amount of like clogged toilets i'm gonna have to yeah, fix the, because yep. of that yeah. right we got that with zeke he was he was a generous, a generous <laughs> user, <laughs> generous donor. You don't need that much toilet paper. Yeah, uh, yeah. And we've gotten. I mean, M. Safina right now is having a blast throwing. In, she's like really good most of the time, and then randomly, Safi- I Sayla, want to watch this drown. Sa- yeah, yeah Sayla right? will be like, Safina's got her hands in the toilet, and I'm like, no, <laughs> sprinting from the kitchen, Why? and she had thrown an entire. And this is probably. This happened like five times. Throwing an entire roll, like unused roll of toilet paper into the toilet. Oh, no. 87 quarters. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah no, Stop. Joke. It's terrible. But it's awesome having kids. And uh, it'll be – I'm excited for you to go through that, Lucas, because it uh, – Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, I like the way you put it. I'm excited for you to go through that. <laughs> There's more <laughs> ear biting to come. It's mm-hmm. character building. Yeah. Yeah. You'll yeah. be, uh, but on the other side of it, it'll be all good. All I, good. I was told that this was kind of payback, though. So we have a, a buddy. He's probably, I don't know, he's early. At the time, he was like mid 50s and uh, worked for a, a medical company. He's a great dude. Um, he lives out in Rio, so now his name's Houston. Just really smart, savvy business guy, but he like worked out just like to kind of stay in shape. He wasn't, he didn't like work out hard, but he was at the gym with a bunch of us in the morning. And I caught him on a leg press on like not just a regular leg press, like one of the machine leg yeah, presses. Yeah. And then he was over there and he did that. I forget what they're called. I don't know the actual name for him. Um, abductors and mm-hmm. adductors. There you go. Adductor, yeah, yeah, we we always call them good girls and bad girls. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> he's so he switches to do that machine. And on that one, like when you're you're the ones that like you're trying to squeeze your legs in. Mm-hmm. It's got you like locked out so you can't move. And uh I snuck up behind him and because he's facing the opposite direction. I snuck up behind him in the middle of his workout. Like he just finished a set and I just gave him a little nibble on his ear <laughs> and he flipped out, but he's stuck on this machine. So he's like trying to get Trump off. Can't get yeah, yeah, he can't get off. And the weight rack is like the stack is like right in front of him. So he tries to get off and then he's tripping and he's like mm-hmm. almost falls off and he's freaking out. And he looks at me and he's like, I almost just cussed out my preacher. Like I almost <laughs> just like laid into him. So I was relaying that story to him and he's like, this is what you get. That was more than a nibble though. No doubt. Yeah, it's <laughs> not a happy camper. Yeah, man. Yeah, what? Nothing. Don't look at me like that. Unbelievable. So, uh, 
I just got back from preaching some youth camps. Yeah. 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 And we, like, y'all's kids, or your your kids are camp age. Yep. Right? And yours are getting into, are you guys doing, like, are y'all going to do kids camp? Does y'all's church do kids camp? Yeah, they do. I think they're a little too young for it. They did. Starts at like eight or nine. VBS, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did VBS and had a blast. We got VBS going this week. Do you? Yeah. VBS was happening for us the week that we were gone, which it was like this double-edged sword because it's like one of my favorite things that we do here, Mm -hmm. but preaching camp is such a good thing for me. So I did 20 sermons in 10 days. Oof. Yeah, so a, a ton of like work and effort, and it's mostly to junior high and high school students, which is so far out of my wheelhouse these days because I'm used to like either putting together like a more broad message for all age groups or targeting something that's like more for young adults um, and kind of hitting that like, <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll give it a good like understanding level, but like hit there so weird to try to change up my um, because I don't change my language right I'll change up some of my illustrations did it annoy y'all at like when you were going to youth camp or when you were at youth events or things like that when the old guys tried to use our words (laughs) oh (laughs) so like I'll do it like iron I'll like ironically say riz or cap Mm. or Mm -hmm. sigma um, wait, wait. This, an, this is more new. What, what well, yeah. Are, are you? Do you know what Sigma is? No, because his kids are. He's raising them right, and they're not on social media. Oh uh, well, yeah. They'll figure it out because they're gonna be, like encounter other kids at jujitsu or whatever. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Sigma. Some, some of it. Is, I, I get some of it. Yeah. Yeah. The Holy Sigma Spirit is, is now <laughs> the word for cool. Oh, Sigma. Sigma. Yeah. If something is like really cool, it's it's Sigma, and it Sigma eclipses Alpha. I know. Okay. Because they're Gen Alpha, so I I don't know how all of this happens. Let them cook. Yep. And if something's (laughs) bad, yeah, no joke. So like I'll ironically use those things, but uh, one of the one of the pieces of feedback that I got from some of the the staffers is they were like, "Hey, thanks for not trying to be cool." So I need to know. (laughs) Like I gotta. How am I supposed to take that? Like, on the one hand, it's like, yeah, you know what? So you're I, just outright I saying that. I'm not cool? Hold yeah, on. like, right. So am I not cool? So I'm Hold here on. today to ask you I guys, think, I think, am I not cool? Well, here, no, I, I, I can't make the determination, but I can say there's a possible, there's a way to interpret what they said as not offensive. Yeah. They could I'm, have been I'm saying interpreting like, it. I'm, I gave them the benefit of the yeah. doubt. I'm taking it as not offensive, but I'm now I'm what asking I'm saying my is, guys. They could have no, said. You're to the... To them, you are cool, but it's an asterisk. <laughs> so, like, like I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, cool with a footnote. <laughs> this dude's cool. Like, he's not cool, but like, he's cool. He stays in his lane, and he's all right. Cool for an That's old. What I'm cool for yeah, an old. Like, okay. Thanks right. for not trying to be cool. You're cool. Yeah. Thanks for not trying to be cool. I, I did have some cool. like feel old moments. So the staffers are like early twenties, like the mm-hmm. kid, the kids that staff the camp. Um, which, you know, I was back in like 2009. So, and I worked the, the camps, like as a camp staffer for several years. One, I'm, this kid has a fever, right? And he's got to go. And I was like, you know what you should try? He's like, I've tried everything. I've tried Advil. I've tried sleep. I've tried on. Okay. So that's, <laughs> that's exactly what I said. I was like, you know, you might try some cowbell. The drummer's got a cowbell. You could try the cowbell. I hear that there are some fevers where that's the only cure. Hold on. So this he actually has a real fever. He's got a real fever. He's yeah. feeling horrible, and this he's is not, your- so he's not feeling horrible. His fever's like ninety nine three, but it's at like that cusp of like, hey, you shouldn't be around the students yeah, yeah, at yeah. this point, right? So it's not. He doesn't have a real fever, and he's a stellar athlete, and he's yeah. like, no, I want to go, yeah. right? He's a he's a college pole vaulter. Like kids in in great shape. So I mentioned that, and these other five people, right, who are all twenty four and under, look at me, and they're like. Why would he do that? Oh man, that's a weird feeling. So you, sure. y'all, none of y'all know about. You guys don't know about the cowbell thing from Saturday Night Live. And one of the the students looked at me, or one of the the staffers, sorry, looks at me and goes, "I've never even heard of Saturday Night Live." I mean, that's it's like okay. That's fair. Do you know Christopher Walken? I'm like, no. no. All right. Well. Go to bed then, because you got a fever. Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, Takes, obviously yeah. this fever has already affected your brain yeah. to the point of sleep it off. I like, guess fried. Yep. <sighs> yeah. That's, That's our so fault bad. for not. But I also getting that. I, like the I, I think there. that that 
affirms that I am not cool. Yeah. I'm glad you came to that own conclu- your own conclusion. Yep. You, you reasoned you yourself you're right. into that. You may conclusion. be right. Yeah, I'm not. It's Which, happened. I think that's across I've, the board, probably. I like it's, Josh's ownership of like... Yeah, this is not like I've become uncool. This is just not. Yeah. But it's okay, man. We, we, we failed by not getting these pertinent things to that's the That's what I like. I, I've been I will, trying with my kids. I'm going to yeah. say, though, I'll say... And, and I'm, we'll move quickly into an actual like meaningful topic. I'm only saying that because one of the few criticisms of our podcast my, is that we spend too long... My security here is not a meaningful topic, whether or not... No. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. That they're like, you guys take too long to get in the topic. Okay, I get okay, it. Yeah, All right, yeah, yeah. fine. We're but trying to figure out what the topic is I right will now. say... <laughs> hold on. I will say... Josh, this is kind of like, this is interesting to me. And by interesting, I mean infuriating. But <laughs> you, so you're saying it's your fault that the next generation doesn't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yet when I say I haven't seen Predator all the way through, or I didn't see Tombstone, Tombstone until recently, or your wife I never watched that. Commando or whatever. Predator. Yeah. You're not the next generation to me. You're <laughs> young. Yeah. Somebody failed you along the way. <laughs> you're, you're, that one wasn't me. You're Star Trek The Last Generation. We've been friends yeah. how long? And, and uh, I, you've, ne- you've never invited me to like watch the movie. But with, I've you been know? telling you about all this stuff. Dude, sometimes you just got to like... Did you, know, you watch, did you watch Point Break? I did watch Point Break. My man. My man. My man. I watched Point Break because... Of I knew how passionate you were about it, this, and I'm like, if I if I'm really gonna call this dude one of my best friends in the world, I really got really got to see his favorite movie. I did, it's man, true. and it was not it was not it did not disappoint. No, you ever fired a gun in, into the air whilst going arg after you blew your knee out? Yeah, jumping a fence, chasing yep. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, Reagan's a lot faster <clears throat> than, than people give him credit um, for. He threw a pit bull at him too. Through that, that was, foot chase. Yeah. That was yeah. a bold move. Mm-hmm. Like he's, r- he's running, but he took time to wait on the porch, pick up a dog, and toss it at him. To keep <laughs> Sketch. It's a great movie. Sorry, guys. It was great. <sighs> Good old point break. Mm-hmm. You know Johnny Utar. Oh, Johnny mm-hmm. Utar. Yep, yep. You guys ready to jump into it? Yeah, please. Let's do it. Let's, do it. Let's so, make the people uh, happy. <laughs> today, our uh, our excerpt is coming from a book called Calling Out the Called by Dr. Scott Pace and Shane Pruitt. Shane Pruitt is the next-gen leader for, uh, I believe, the, the North American Mission Board or the SPC or something like that. So, great dude. Um, these two guys collaborated on writing this book to address one of the major issues that's happening just kind of in Christianity across the board is the lack of young leaders. And so um, um, I don't want to get into too much of a controversial topic here, but I, I have some friends and we're having the discussion about um, the lack of people in ministry and how we're seeing like a rise of um, like theological debates around who can and can't, who should and shouldn't be qualified to, to yep. go into ministry. Yep. And so one of the questions that I asked this, this particular group of guys as we're having this discussion, I was like, how much time uh, are you investing into having these theological discussions about who is and isn't qualified to go into ministry versus the amount of time that you're actually investing into raising up leaders? Because I think that if we actually invested time into our young people who have leadership potential in developing them and discipling them and in helping them become leaders, then all of these theological debates that we're spending all of our time on now, all of a sudden they become immaterial because we've done our job. So this is not as much a a thing from my perspective as like, Hey, we need to be arguing about this as much as it is like, Hey, this is evidence that we're actually sucking at our job. Um, so calling out the cold is is kind of uh, its purpose to, to head a, hit a reset button on that. And they mentioned like several reasons why that doesn't happen. So there's two excerpts that I'm going to read. Uh, the first one is how can we talk about calling? And oftentimes when we think about calling, we think about like people being called to vocational ministry, but um, you know, ministry is a job or that kind of thing. But it it looks uh, a bunch of different ways. And so. I'll uh, I'll start with this one and then um, we'll we'll wrap with another about like checking your motives if this is something that you're wrestling with. So if we're going to commit to calling out the called, we must also consider the practical ways that we can do this in our ministries that are both 
biblically sound and personally responsible. While not every ministry context looks the same, some applicable principles and ongoing action points can help facilitate this work and fertilize the soil of any ministry. But it starts with a patient mindset and a humble faith that pursue more of a climate of change in our ministries rather than creating lightning strike moments. I think that's a really important point. Calling should be a concept that is regularly talked about in our ministry in a variety of ways. By integrating some of these principles and practices, we can help facilitate healthy conversations with our people that can lead to prayerful consideration about their potential ministerial calling. Uh, Number one, extended invitations. Perhaps the most obvious way we can cultivate this type of calling culture is to regularly include a ministerial calling as it is possible as uh, an invitation for response. If our listeners are not aware or do not know that it's an option to prayerfully consider, then it's difficult for them to discern this type of calling as a part of God's will for their own lives. Our appeal or response in whatever form is appropriate for our context should not only provide opportunities for people to trust Christ for salvation, but they should also invite believers to consider vocational ministry and career missions as a possibility. Uh, Share testimonies. In any situation, some of the most difficult hurdles to overcome are the fear of the unknown and the misconception of the familiar. Personal testimonies of those who have been called into vocational ministry can help our people disarm their fears and clarify their understanding to consider what full-time ministry service really involves. We should regularly refer to our calling in order to exhort all believers towards obedience and surrender, regardless of their unique calling, and to help those who may be considering a ministerial calling. Celebrate the church. Many people are conditioned to have a negative view of the church. Whether through cultural influences or personal experiences, many believers have been disappointed and have become disenchanted by the church. Beyond the church itself, sometimes we can also be guilty of of bemoaning our ministry responsibilities or complaining about relational dynamics to garner sympathy and appreciation. But this cynical disposition can sour our people towards vocational ministry. While our goal should not be to shield people from the truth or promote a ministry facade, we should model a love for the church as the body and bride of Christ that is positive, affirming, and exhibits gratitude for the privilege of serving the Lord in a ministry capacity. Provide opportunities. A primary element of discerning a calling to ministry involves discovering spiritual passions and gifts through service opportunities. We may be guilty at times of holding ministry responsibilities with a closed fist instead of an open hand, whether the result of personal insecurity, a desire for control, a lack of trust in others, or an ego that craves credit. We must relinquish our selfish desires to encourage, enable, and empower others to do the work of the ministry as people explore, exercise, and employ their spiritual gifts that they may also discern God's calling on their lives to serve in a similar vocational capacity. And the last one, train leaders. As we cultivate a ministry environment that cooperates with the Spirit in calling out the called, we must be prepared to mentor those who discern a call to vocational ministry. There is no substitute for your personal investment in their lives. In many ways, the discipleship process is identical to what we would do for every follower of Christ. And yet... Like any other vocational apprenticeship, particular skills, competencies, values, and character attributes are necessary for their successful and learned and are learned through experience. Whether we provide this training through a formal internship position or through an intentional mentoring relationship, we must be available to invest in these future leaders. As ministers, this is a weighty matter of personal stewardship because God entrusts us with their development as they discern, clarify, and pursue their callings. So a couple of things that I think are really interesting about this one, like obviously this is written to pastors, youth pastors, that kind of thing. But I do think that so many of these bits apply to all believers. The reason I wove in kind of the youth camp stuff that we were talking about earlier is across the board, one of the things that we're seeing is this withdrawal from uh, young people seeing like being on a camp staff for a summer as an opportunity. Right. Mm. And they're looking kind of for those like lightning strike moments. Well, like God didn't call me to do this or uh, I don't feel called to do X, Y, or Z. And so, you know, for you guys, there's a couple of questions that I want to ask. One is like, you know, how, how do you know when you are called to do something? Because I think the way that we talk about it in church, um, and this kind of comes to some of the points here, is that we're all waiting for that like lightning bolt moment where we know beyond a shadow of a doubt or we hear the audible voice of God or, you know, whatever it is that like, oh, this is definitely what I'm called to do. This is it. And then when we hear other people talk about those moments, 
then I think that reinforces that. But like what in your life has the calling of God uh, felt like in different scenarios? Like or at different times maybe, yeah? It's a great mm. question. That's a really good question. Thank um, you. I only ask the best of questions. <laughs> Clearly. On the spot. Um, do you have anything right away? I do, but I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear what you had to say. No, you I, don't have some, you're I, thinking about it still. Processing. Yeah, it's. I I did want to point out like Lucas is right. A lot of people are looking for that lightning bolt moment mm-hmm. or like mm-hmm. a huge lit up billboard that's like yeah. Josh, <laughs> go do this, um, and it's not always like yeah. that. Um, yeah, I, the most recent one obviously was probably starting this podcast, and mm-hmm. it was just kind of an uncomfortable feeling is what it was that I instantly put away and then Isaac brought it up to me and I was like, oh, that's not a good sign. Like, <laughs> yeah. Now there's confirmation. No, I, I already dismissed that. Yeah, dude. I already put Let that, that away. You should have asked me soon. No. <laughs> um, but I mean, that that's... Yeah. If you're actively seeking, I think you will... <sighs> there's a fine line. You can force confirmations like if you try yeah. to push it. In, but if you're genuinely seeking what you're supposed to be doing the confirmations will be there so if you need well for me i needed like that extra we've told the story before but when isaac brought it up i was like i don't want to do that (laughs) yeah so it was wanting to do what i was called to do even though it was not something I wanted yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, and it's not because you didn't care about, I'm clarifying everyone yes, knows this because yes. they know you, but it's not because you didn't care about people or, or, or see the value in being able to do this, but it was just already going to add to a long list of things, you know, you already had to do and put on, effort towards. on top of what I, one of the things Lucas mentioned in that section was, you know, feeling unqualified. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think all those, Go into it. But yeah, so that's the most recent one for me. But I think mm-hmm. I think that's a normal occurrence. I, I have no stats on this, but I would say typically it's it's probably more than likely going to be more that style than a huge billboard of yes, you need to go do yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like a a Jonah experience. Yeah, or I mean, but like I even like you take. <laughs> I would hate to have one of those. Me too. <laughs> hey, everybody else is like, hey. We we're pretty sure this is something like well you you're the only one on the boat not praying will you please pray and John is like nah nah <laughs> screw you it's, guys it's me you're gonna have to throw me overboard he's like you're not gonna go overboard like nah, nah. gonna have to throw me <laughs> throw me <laughs> yeah like he essentially is like if you guys want this storm to stop you're gonna have to toss me I'm yeah. sorry about all the cargo that you just threw overboard yeah. thinking it was that this is totally it's me, me. Yeah. but I'm still gonna fight you and yeah you yes. like I'm there. not. I'm not gonna go. Yeah, no. yeah. you're gonna have to make. When me. God literally Gosh. just saying like Jonah, you know, like, yeah. yeah, go go to Nineveh, go do this. But you take Moses though, like he had uh, all the excuses on why he couldn't. And it's like, yeah, okay, he, there's a literal burning bush talking. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Him. Like, yeah, yeah. That's a pretty lit up sign. And even with that, he's like, yeah, I don't speak too well. I, I guess. <laughs> Well, I don't talk good. So to, yeah. to listen that here, point, burning bush. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To to that point, I'd say I'm not. This is not always like this. Sometimes, God, well, God has given us giftings, passions, sure. like that that have equipped us and prepared us f- to serve in a certain capacity. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there are certain things yeah. that you're like, oh, I get that. I can. Yeah, I can do well at that. And yes, there's some that are out of your comfort zone. That's and, and I sure. would say a lot of times when God wants me to do something. It's not necessarily the most comfortable thing that I want to do all the time, which is yeah. which is like, why would I be feeling a feeling of needing to do this thing that I know I don't want to do? Yeah, that's not originating in my heart. It was like, oh, you want me to just like, whatever, just go lift at the gym for four hours and not do anything else, and you know, and then hang out all day with my family and and eat steak. Yeah. Oh, okay. That sounds terrible, but I'll do it, God. You know, it's yeah. my burden to bear. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's like okay, that, okay, Fourth that's thing. easy, but yeah. it's like oh, you want me to go do this thing where I need to be uncomfortable and I have to okay, I, okay, that sounds more like something that God's asking me to do, and not that I'm not saying yeah. it's always going to be uncomfortable or whatever. It, but it, so that's one way. But I would say 
and this is kind of like a sidestep, but you'll understand what I mean by this, Lucas, because I think I won't understand. We were just talking. Well, <laughs> to answer his question, like kind of indirectly, but you yeah. and I were talking about this the other day. But sometimes people are like waiting for God to tell them what to do. Yeah. But he's like, no, I already told you what to do. Yeah. Like th- broadly, I told you. Yep. To, I mean, if we just look at what we're what's already listed for us to do, which is to you know to take care of widows and orphans mm-hmm. and. You know, and to share the gospel and make disciples and baptize people. Yeah, and, and you know, don't yeah. forget the poor. Love one another. Yeah, like those. Good yes, things. teach yeah. teach people all works. that I've commanded you. Yeah, you know, the Great Commission. Like, okay, all of these things. You already have a laundry list of things that you could start doing that God's already told all of us we need to do. And it's not just like a vocational minister thing. Right. It's a all believers, all sons and daughters of the of the King thing to do. Like, so I'd say. You but know, it's not, and, those aren't fun things. No, no, no. Yeah. Because they're not you centered things. They're right. Christ centered things. That's why. But as yeah. you start taking those steps and doing those, that's when yes, other steps yep. or other things will be revealed, I think. Absolutely. If you're just sitting back, 100%. If you're just sitting back waiting, like, you got to. You got to take that step. I'm not forward. doing anything because I haven't seen a billboard yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, just, I'm, I'm waiting to hear what God wants you to do. Well, yeah. are you doing all the other things? Like, yep. At Echelon Front, it's the small iterative decisions. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if this is. I'm like, obviously, you're not doing something wrong, but I don't right. know if this is the right thing for my. But you know, I'm going to go this way. Yeah, and things will open up, or things won't open up. You're like, well. Yeah, time that's to pivot. the yeah, yeah. and the, so this is one of the things that we're running into with with these particular youth camps is one is the the college students or young adults don't know that it's an option, right? And so there's the presenting it's an option to them um, because they're not looking for it. The second thing that's really weird is that they're being talked out of it, and that hey, I think I'm going to do this this camp, and they're like, why would you do that? Why would you go and do this camp where you're you're probably gonna be stressed out? Like you're working from six a.m. to eleven p.m. You're you're gonna end up working like sixty days over the summer. That's like that. Like, what is this doing to further your career? Mm. And that's one of the big pivots. Like this internship could be better for you than going to do this camp. Or you know, if you just stay home and work and save a little money, that's gonna be better than than doing this. Or you know, take a summer class or whatever. Like the the idea that you know, what, what you're thinking about doing when it comes to any type of ministry, not just vocational ministry. I know the book is kind of centered around that, but even like servanthood, uh, that if it's not going to further your career and your goals, then it's a waste of your time. Oh man. And that's, that's becoming a really, really prevalent idea within, within the church. I was having a conversation with a, a really good friend of mine, um, this past weekend and, we were talking and he was like, you know, I, cause I was asking him, he, he moved to a new area and I was like, so what, you know, what church are you getting plugged into? And he was like, I'm only going to be there for like two or three years. So I, I probably like, you know, I've visited some churches. I haven't really found one that I, that I like super liked yet, but I, I may not, you know, I was like, listen, th- there was a, a really solid piece of advice that I got years ago from a friend. And he was like, listen, uh, pick a church and stick with them. Mm-hmm. Right, find a church that's theologically sound. We talked about this a little bit on the last episode. Find a church that's theologically sound, and then uh, stick with them like you would your family. Like make the decision to be there, not to church hop and not to do these other things, no matter how long it's going to be. And you know, I was, I was talking to this guy, and I was telling him this the same kind of thing. I was like, because if okay, so if you're only there for two or three years, right? Two or three years of you with your skill set, your, your talents, your leadership style, your ability to train people, like two or three years of that has the potential to really leave a lasting impact Mm. on this church. Um, and if you're sitting around waiting for yourself to like have this lightning bolt moment of like, Oh, I don't feel called to do this. Then what you're really doing is giving your giving yourself an out to not do anything. Right. Right. They're like, unless God specifically tells me to do X, Y, or Z. Well, if we look throughout the entire biblical account, there are very few times where that happens. You know, like even though David was a prophet, but that I can't recall a time and I could be wrong about this, but I can't recall a time where God shows up to David and says, Hey, listen, you kind of need to do this. 
No, David is a guy after God's own heart. Yeah. He's pursuing the Lord through right. prayer. He's pursuing the Lord through worship. Um, he's studying the scriptures, and he knows, like they're in the, um, not in the biblical text, but in sort of the the extra biblical the extra biblical text that kind of like surround David. One of the things he's known for is like gathering the children together in the city center of of uh, Jerusalem, and that like he brings the kids together and he takes off his outer garment and ties it around his waist and he sits down and he teaches the kids. Wow. Right. So, uh, like those, those types of things, which are sort of in, in that, like legends sort of area, but like, that's the kind of attitude that he had towards the scriptures. So he knew what God wanted. Right. He knew what God desired of him. He knew what God's expectations were for people that followed him. So when it was time for him to make decisions, he didn't need that lightning bolt moment. He just knew like, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm supposed to serve. I'm supposed to go X, Y, Z. So, and he, you know, obviously made mistakes in that kind of thing as well that, uh, that are prominently highlighted, but the balance to that is, you know, for our lives. So many times we're waiting for a moment like what Moses had. We're waiting for the bush to mm-hmm. catch on fire when to Isaac's point, like we've already been told to go. Yeah. And, and that, so what do you think, you know, we, we talked a little bit about what's keeping some of these these kids from doing these summer staffs. I keep calling them kids, these young adults from doing these summer staff things. What do you think in your experiences, um, whether personal or, or with the people that you've worked with or, or trying to disciple, what is it that is preventing folks from like, literally just serving in the ways that they should be as all of us are called to minister? I'll say I think you you touched on it earlier, but it's the what's in it for me mindset. Yeah. If it doesn't have a direct correlation to how much money I can make, it's not uh, worthwhile. Mm-hmm. And um, which is really just a perversion of a, of a good thing. Like you need to provide and you need to uh, you need to. It's biblical to provide and to work and to take care of your family. Absolutely important. Um, but to say that a ministry opportunity or a vocational ministry, or whatever might has no, there's n- no benefit of you. Like you'll gain nothing from it. If you don't gain money from it, yeah. um, I think it keeps people from, uh, that's a big barrier of, to entry or a big barrier, a big opposition. I'd say. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think also th- this doesn't apply across the board, but I think a lot of, younger adults, younger generation, we, we live in a time of such instant gratification mm-hmm. that the thought of doing something difficult like that is just foreign yeah. to a, a lot. Of, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, That's true. I, I just think there's, I mean, it kind of goes back to like joking, like we failed the younger generation when I was talking about showing them all these classic things, uh-huh. but mm-hmm. like, it's easy to do. Like I, I didn't have it easy coming up. So most parents want better for their kids, but it's a, a, a fine line because you can make it so easy for your kids that once they get out in the real world, they're like, Oh wait, they don't know how to function. I yeah. have to yep. put in work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's probably a level of that of just, I mean, I even take it like from my, my kickboxing gym, like trying to hire people, the people I have are great, but they're hard to find because people don't want to put in that much effort. It seems like, because they're so used to whatever I want, I can get it right now. Right. Right. I got a buddy who owns a coffee shop and his, um, employee retention is terrible. Because everybody's like, no, I want to work at a coffee shop because it's super chill. And then the first time they show up 30 minutes late and he's like, hey, I got to write you up. They're like, for what? It's like, you you were a half hour late to work. I'm like, yeah, but it's like a, a coffee shop. And he's like, right. right. And, and you have responsibilities now because it's yeah. also a job. Yeah. Yeah. So a half hour late is, is not it. Or they call in a couple of times or no call, no show. And he's like, no, you don't have a job anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, how come? Like, you, didn't you, come. Didn't, you didn't show up for work. I had to leave what I was doing. Right, all of the important things that like that I have to do in my job now didn't get done, and they're like, "Okay, but that how does that affect me?" Like, yeah. oh, it affects you yep. now because you're fired, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dude. 
<laughs> well, Lucas, something else you said earlier, I think is a good point too. Like modeling a love for the church was like a yeah. section that, and I think that there's kind of a, had it sort of been devalued, like mm-hmm. a, a, being plugged into a good church. Uh, cause I, I hear this phrase way more often than I want to nowadays where people are like, well, I don't need to go to a church like to love God. I don't, you know, like, and I think that that's weird. I've heard that a lot. Like yeah. I don't need to, I have a relationship with God. I don't need to be plugged into a church. I don't have to go to church. Yeah. And it's, I think that's one of the unintended consequences of the, like, okay. So Steven's got his big hang up of, uh, don't call it a quiet time. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my big ones is that I struggle with is that, you know, it's not a religion, it's a relationship mm-hmm. because it is a religion. It is a religion. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and when, when we put so much emphasis on that relationship thing about like the personal relationship is personal and blah, blah, blah. Like that is of the uttermost importance within how we understand our relationship with Christ, mm-hmm. how we, um, are able to have access to salvation, that all those things, that it is a personal decision that has to be made, that you are called individually by the Holy Spirit, um, by grace through faith, right? All of those things. But we've put such an emphasis on that, that what we've done is we've de-emphasized the, the need for community yeah. when the church was established by, right. by Christ for that purpose. Um, and that we're admonished against it in in Hebrews, like do not neglect the fellowship yeah. that you have with one yeah. another. And because of all of that emphasis that we put on, like, oh, it's a personal relationship, then we have given people the excuse. It's like I said, one of the unintended consequences. We've given people that excuse of like, no, you don't need to come to church. Your relationship is just between you and Jesus. And That's it's not what he. Yeah, and it's really not right. And. As much as like your your salvation, your sanctification process is like that personal between you and and the Holy Spirit, like your relationship with with God, your relationship with Christ, if it's just between the two of you, then you are not living the lifestyle that is modeled for us in Correct. the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Both that, of those things are true. Yeah, they're not mutually exclusive, right. and we try to make them that way. Yeah. yeah. I so, think that that's one of the barriers. It's just people not having a, they don't value, they don't have a high value on serving. Like you said earlier mm-hmm. about the kids, about the kids, the young adults, like not seeing it as an opportunity, seeing it as like a, I guess I'll go help them out. It's like, no, this is for you too. Like you will gain so much and you'll gain, you're going to serve the Lord. You're going to learn a lot through this. You're going to make some lasting relationships and friendships. And who knows, like maybe God has you going to this thing and serving here because you're going to meet some people that you're going to know for the rest of your life, or it's going to open the door for the calling and ministry he has for you or whatever. So yeah, I think that's. Well, and those those tie together because the other thing I wrote down was, uh, relinquish our self desire and empower others. And you said train leaders. Well, yeah. if you're, you should focus on your personal relationship. You should, but if if you're not doing the other things, you are failing those that you should be empowering to lead. Yeah. But how quick also are we to 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 be like? We can be sometimes and be like oh, this. This next generation, they're not even they're not even going. Yeah. I think oh, that's the, and I think that's yeah, the so much. point I'm gathering of what this book is. I haven't read the book, but yeah. um, all of the things we've said are true. But then there's that facet of it of we haven't done our part to train them or mm-hmm. show them the way. I mean, uh, how could it be that some of these kids kids they are they are kids yeah. they yeah. could be my children yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but see how you are acting in church or in these roles you have and they're like well, I don't I don't want to do that. He's not he's not training me. He's not empowering me to do mm-hmm. anything. But then we're like I, I got to do all this by myself. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's one of the things we did with our worship team is, you know, they're I I walk that line like having been um a performance musician versus like a worship leader. Those are two vastly different things. That there were things that we did on stage that were necessary in order to keep uh, an audience engaged, right? Like you want to find some people to make eye contact with, like especially if you're singing a song that's like really emotional, like you find somebody that's into it and you make eye contact with them and now all of a sudden like fan for life kind of thing, right? Then you don't do that in worship because it's not about you. right? right? But one of the things you should do 
that a lot of musicians don't is you should smile. <laughs> and and we were talking with our, our worship team about this a couple of years ago. It's like, you guys need to smile whenever you're leading worship. And like, why? Like, because... Show that you're happy. And, and I was like, <laughs> go back and look at the live stream. Um, because when you're not smiling, it looks like you are having a miserable time leading people in worship. So we're just going to try it. We're going to try it for six weeks. I put a little sticky note on everybody's music stand that said smile, right, where they could see it. And uh, the, the, the worship environment overall really improved because everybody was looking at the worship team and they looked like they were having a good time. Mm-hmm. And like they were enjoying what they were doing. It's not that they weren't before, right? But they just weren't physically expressing that because they were concentrating on the chord charts yeah. and making sure that their I'm runs right. and stuff were right. Like there's a lot going on right. up there. But you know, in the first couple of weeks, like there were extra mistakes because people were focusing on smiling, right? The sticky note was getting the attention, and so we would miss, you know, the a chord going into the bridge or whatever. But overall, the worship experience got a lot better. And it's because of this principle that, like, they were showing that they were enjoying what they were doing. When we talk about the church like it's an enjoyable place to go, then then there's that. You know, the other thing, uh, T-Rex, I, I was listening to this guy, this um, man, he's, a, like, a, a black preacher from the southeast. I forget what his name is, but I get sent his clips periodically. And he was talking about church hurt. And he goes, you know, uh, people people will leave a church— and leave the church in general because the church hurt. And he's like, but nobody leaves uh, a school because the school hurt. Nobody stops yeah. going to malls because the mall hurt. Uh-huh. You know, and I was thinking, like, how many times did did we get into fights or altercations or something like that growing up mm-hmm. at a mall? Yeah. Right? See some guys from a, another school or just another, you know, a group of, of guys that, like, rip, rubbed you the wrong way or whatever. Yeah. Words start flying. Food starts flying. Maybe fists start going. The security yeah. guards break it up send everybody home. But, you know, the next weekend we went back to that mall yeah. and the the point that I got out of it was because all of those places have something that we need. Yes. Right? And we no longer oh, look at the mm. church as a place that has something that mm-hmm. we need. And that's I think good. that that mindset shift is one that that's really got to be made. I totally agree. I saw a clip that was talking about like t- to that point, people leave church because of, you know, because humans failed them. They were like, yeah the other apostles didn't leave after what Judas did. Like they, they weren't like, I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, That's whatever disenchanted with this experience because of Judas, I'm out of here. They're like, no, I love Jesus. I'm following him. I get to walk with the son of God. Like, yeah. and nothing's going to bump me off of that path. Right. Especially because you know, people are sinful and they fail and they fall away. It's like, that's not a discouragement to me. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and church hurts are real. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no and, doubt. And, 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 yeah, and I'm not those, trying to trivialize I know, I those know. things. Yeah. yeah but. And those churches suck. They do. Yeah. Um, but we aren't quitters. No. Right. So you're right. Like, why? I've fallen in it. Mm-hmm. I was out of church for a long time. Um, and, like, but, but we're not quitters. There's nowhere in there, like, well, this happened, so I'm just done with that part of it. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, no. yeah and I, I, how does that register in your brain? Right. Like, and who was your relationship with, or what, what were you going for? And yeah. how good was your, if you're being honest, how good was your personal relationship if sure. these people throw you off of it that bad? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I do think there's this interesting uh, dichotomy of expectations and reality when it comes to the church, right? that we come to the church because we know that we are in need of uh, a savior. We're in need to confess our sins. We, we need to um, become closer to God through sanctification, corporate worship, those types of things. So our reality is that, but our expectation is that the person next to us has all their crap together. Right. Like yeah. they're here because they've got everything together. Mm. I'm here because I'm a sinner and right. need I'm help. I'm a mess. Right. And and I think if we were to give one another a little bit more of that grace that like maybe the person that's next to me is here for the same reason that I am. Yep. Instead of like, nope, they're in church, they're supposed to be perfect. Well, well, and if you're that, finding, that's a standard I can't live up to. If you're finding that community in church and you're building those relationships, it will be more evident. It starts to manifest yeah, itself. You'll, right. You'll hang out. And yeah. you'll realize, oh no, they don't have yeah. everything together. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, do I. the flip side of this, and I want to I want to get into it. I know this is going to be a much longer conversation. We got to wrap up here in about fifteen minutes or so. 
is uh, is the people that look at ministry because of the sexiness of the platform, mm. right? And we've had um, here in the DFW area, uh, we we recently have had some pastors who have stepped down from their position. Um, I, I think the one who's probably most prominent about this right now is uh, Carl Lentz, who mm. used to be the yeah. the pastor up at Hillsong. Yep. And um, it was in New York, right? Yep. Yeah. And and he's gone on, him and his wife have had a very open discussion about some of these things. And one of the things he talked about was that he got platformed because he was a good speaker and was charismatic, not because he was living a lifestyle that was evident of the good fruit that yeah. that God had done in his life. And so there is a section uh, in this, um, in the beginning, that says check your motives. And so if this is something that you are, you're considering doing is taking a step into ministry, if you are thinking about the like, hey, maybe God does have a calling on my life, then one of the things that I would ask you to do is is not just to like read, obviously, this book to to do this, listen to what this is, but there's a book called Spiritual Leadership by a guy named J. Oswald Sanders. And, um, and his book gets so in-depth into... Uh, one thing in particular is that the spiritual leader is not meant to be personally ambitious. That when we become personally ambitious, that we lose sight of of our goals. So yep. uh, this section is called Check Your Motives. Another step involved in wrestling with our call involves a hard look in the mirror as we check our motives. Many people begin pursuing what they perceive to be a call to ministry without recognizing the well-meaning but misguided motives that can be involved. There are three primary misleading reasons people begin to pursue ministry. The first misguided motive that can be mistaken as a call to ministry is appreciation. When people are initially saved or when they experience a fresh work of God in their lives, naturally gratitude flows from their heart. It seems logical that the greatest possible way to express their appreciation is to surrender to a deeper level of service and obedience in association with this vocational ministry. Uh, But this fails to consider how God may use them in a greater capacity from a career platform. And wrestling with the call to ministry, we must avoid the idea that vocational ministry is somehow more valuable to God. That is one of the greatest yes. statements in this book. Yes, yeah. yeah. The, this mindset undermines the concept of grace by attempting to, quote, pay him back for all he's done in our lives. Certainly, we should be filled with thanksgiving, but appreciation for God's kindness does not equate a call to ministry. Mm. Another misguided motive that leads to a false sense of calling is admiration. When the Lord uses ministerial leadership to impact us, we can become enamored with their leadership and role. Understandably, our respect and gratitude for their personal involvement in our lives can produce a sense of obligation to, quote, pay it forward. While passing their spiritual investment on to others is biblical, we see that in 2 Timothy 2.2, it does not have to come from a position of ministry leadership. More importantly... We must be careful that admiring our leaders does not become an unintended desire to be admired by others. In other words, sometimes it's not just the role they played, but the position they occupied that becomes a dangerous motivation for pursuing a call to ministry. I think that's kind of uh, where Carl Lentz is in that one and Mm -hmm. in the last one from as he's kind of unpacked things. Uh, One final misguided motive that must be identified and avoided is ungodly ambition. Mm -hmm. While we all know that we should not pursue ministry for the wrong reasons, Scripture repeatedly cautions against this reality. The Apostle Peter warns us to guard, or warns leaders to guard themselves against the dangerous motives of money and power. In the qualifications for church leaders, Scripture forbids them from being greedy for money. Paul repeatedly identified the gospel as the primary impetus for his service in contrast with the selfish greed and personal glory that motivated many of his ministry opponents. Although friends and family members may discourage us from pursuing ministry because they perceive it to be a vow of poverty, some become leaders believing that godliness is a way to material gain. In essence, these people cheapen the gospel by preaching and teaching for financial prosperity. Yeah. I so mean, that's just yucky. Yeah, yeah I mean, but but those are the real like check your motive things, right? Or um because they're all of those things exist. Yeah. And how many of you know, we I won't say that we didn't have any of these issues before. They've obviously all of these things have been prevalent in the church in different eras. But if we look really at the last 
120 years of the church, going back to the early early uh, 20th century, the early 1900s, Isaac, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will. Um, <laughs> there are some movements that have been, and I don't want to classify them as non-denominational movements or charismatic movements or anything like that in in the way that we look at those things today. But there were people that broke off from traditional denominations or began to preach a slightly different gospel in order that they might be um, that that they might be the focal point of yeah. of the worship. Yeah, uh, you know um, that's exactly what we see with with LDS with Latter Day Saints mm-hmm. and and all those types of things. And so there is this, there has always been this uh, this type of thing, and we see it. Um, Oh, good grief. I forget the guy's name. Uh, he's a magician in the book of Acts. And he comes to uh, he comes to some of the apostles and he asks them if he can buy how much money it's going to cost him to get the Holy Spirit the way that they have it so that he can heal people and all this stuff, too. And they're <laughs> yeah. like, bro, that's not how it works. It's not how any of this works. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's this weird it's this weird thing. But going back to to what I was saying a second ago, the the idea that in the last 120 years we have glorified ministers um, and we have propped them up in such a way that when they fall, they, they tarnish the reputation of Christianity and of Christ kind of across the board Mm -hmm. with televangelists or or people who've been put in prominent positions or the stuff that we've been talking about in in Dallas, all of those things kind of um, I think lend credence to that. However, if we were to, at any point in time, do this motivation check, if they were to do it, they would find that they were out of alignment in one of these areas. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So, um, and and Isaac, I'll uh, I'll start with you. In your experience, right? How have these sort of ego checks or these moral inventories, whatever you want to call it, these looks in the mirror, how have they shaped your leadership? And and change the way that you've done things whenever you found out that maybe you were out of alignment with one of these things. Well, I, so I, you know, I led worship. So I worked here. I was on staff at, at this church. Yeah, you were with you for and, a minute. Yeah. For yep. a minute. And then yep. you got poached. I did. Get but, poached. but whatever. More yeah. Than but if you Water believe God is sovereign, bridge. then you just say, all right, Lord, I, I do. I, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think the Lord sends poachers and uh, <laughs> yeah. I think it's fine. Yeah. And he works all things together for the good of those. I love him. Um, so he, so, and then I was on staff at a church for, uh, five years uh, leading worship. And so leading worship is kind of, um, there are many opportunities to get off track. Um, oh, like for you, sure. You talked about music and leading yeah. worship and how it's not, music just has a way of, especially if you're talented in music or singing or playing an instrument or whatever, it can be, there is an, a temptation to be like, oh, this is about me or people like this about me. And so this is, you know, whatever I have some unique thing to bring to this experience and it therefore somehow it has something to do with me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Don't lose your train of thought. And I have never been any of those roles. So I'm the outsider on this, but I I would say it's also possible. Like you don't start out seeking that sometimes, but it's real easy when that attention or power or whatever comes that, it's a temptation you could fall into, even yes. if your initial motives were pure. Yeah, I My, mean, as soon as you get on a stage, what's elevated? You are. You right. literally are elevated. Yeah, you're a, like they, that's it. Everyone is looking yeah. up to you, and then you are like, in a situation where they're you're here automatically. For me. Yep, where you're positionally in a place of power. Yep, and and all of those things like really start to mess with your head. Yeah. So so, so for me, yeah. it, I. And I'm thankful that that this specific, you know, there's no like my sin or temptation was not any better than this one. I just didn't happen to fall into this because I, I've i kind of struggled with the opposite where like instead of feeling, well, I'm elevated and I'm special and I have, you know, all these people are looking at me. It was the opposite. It was like if people, if I didn't get a certain if I didn't get certain feedback, I didn't feel like I was actually doing what God called me to do. Like yep. if, if people weren't moved visibly, like I'm leading worship and I would just be like, oh, nobody's people are not, yeah, nobody's yeah. into this song. Like, oh, this is, man, I'm, this is the wrong song to play. I yep. need to work. take this one off the list. I got to try harder. Yeah. yeah. And so, 
but which was like a complete that's totally backwards and had nothing to do with them. I mean, of course, you, you as a worship leader, you are leading people and you can't uh, discount the you, the job that you have to actually bring people along and be someone worthy of following to, to the to the inner tent, you know, yeah. like come, come over here. And there are some people who are really gifted at like just drawing people in and saying, let's go this way. Um, so, th- so I had to get better at those things, of course, and, um, worked on that continually. But yeah, I would, I would like the distraction for me was just, if I'm, if they're not responding in a certain way, then I'm not accurately doing, I'm not actually doing what God called me to do. And I'm not walking in my calling and getting so I, I had a hundred percent of this yeah. experience preaching these back to back camps. Yeah. Like the first one, I got nothing. Yeah. And then the second one, I was like, Lord, I just need to know that I'm effective at yeah. what I'm doing here. Yeah. Right. Like I'm not asking for like the floodgates to open up with encouragement or anything like that. Or, you know, like I don't need weeping and for the whole, you <laughs> yeah. know, group right, to come yeah. forward. I just need something to let me know that like what I'm doing is effective. And that's <laughs> and a, that then, sounds like a fine line too, yeah. because <clears throat> excuse me, you could easily, even though your posture is humility, you can still make it about you. Oh, you right. S- you can still do it for the likes. Right. A hundred percent. And then what happens if you do get it? And this, this is like, there would be weeks <clears throat> where people felt like they were visibly, it looked like they were responding to the music and then that would give me a little boost of like, okay, cool, cool. We're like, we're on it, you know, but it wasn't, that's, that's perverse too. Cause it's not, shouldn't it be based on just some outward sign of like, mm-hmm. you know, what I think qualifies as me doing what I'm supposed to do, right. you know, what God <laughs> called me to do. Um, uh, I was listening to a sermon by Matt Chandler recently where he was talking about Jonah and he was like, he's like, dude, the, the message that he went to preach was not a popular message. And you know, if he was looking for feedback, or like uh like a, ooh yeah man like amen you know they're hyping him up <laughs> yeah. no his message was like in 3 days Nineveh will be destroyed that was his entire thing there wasn't the gospel there was it was just like that's his message yeah when he first gets there like well yeah but he makes it about him and doesn't he get upset because oh, yeah. they yeah, actually get they get right and then he's oh, like yeah. He goes and hides uh, under a fine. Yeah, hides under a tree. Uh, a tree. I brought this yeah. message, and, <laughs> yeah. and now Dude, actually, now my enemies aren't going to be destroyed. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, yeah. I'll show this you to you guys. You didn't even want to be here, bro. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm not. I won't. Uh, we won't put this picture up because it's got uh, the faces of kids in it. But I was asking for that encouragement, and then this is a, a picture that I got sent of. Uh, three kids that were three students who were at youth camp that all got baptized at one of wow. the churches, right? That's encouraging. So yeah, and then there's another like little guy in there who uh, um, accepted Christ whenever he got home. The, like that is that's what I was the encouragement that I needed. Yeah, not and there were a few people like the next day they were like, hey, you know what, you're doing a good job. I'm I'm really getting a lot out of your sermons and that kind of stuff. So that gave me the little shot in the arm kind of boost. And then that came and I was like, all right, this is it. This is Dude, this and, is the affirmation that there's I'm a difference. Yes, in, and then I'm being used by the Holy Spirit. Not that I'm doing anything, right. but the there's Holy a Spirit difference still in using me well. Yeah, seeking to be doing it the right way mm-hmm. than seeking it. It's me. Yeah, like, that, that. So I've had an experience like where I shared uh, something that I felt specifically I should share from before we before I jumped into the worship set that I was leading one yeah. week, and I just read this excerpt from this book and actually you know what it was nope it was a it's this, it was weird it was this puritan prayer book that you gave me oh yeah from I, valley of vision valley of vision yeah it's great stuff man. and i read um i just was reading the titles of the entries because uh-huh. i love the way the like i love the posture that they approach god in like oh, yeah. the, the language just like so beautifully written in it and i was explaining to the congregation like this is a great way to set your heart and your affections on God is to, before you even say what you want to him, you are like addressing him properly. Cause I mean, those, all those entries are like yeah. creator of the universe, like love, like Beautifully lover of written. my soul, yeah. you know, um, maker of all good thing, giver of all good gifts, like that kind of thing. Uh, and so I shared this thing and that was it. And we just kind of moved on and like, I didn't, think anything of it and then like a couple weeks later someone came up to me and was like hey man I've been meaning to tell you like you read this thing and man that that's blessed the way like I that changed how I write like I write in a prayer journal and that that started to help me write differently in my prayer journal I just have yeah. been forgetting like meaning to come up and tell you this and so again it wasn't like 
what was cool is I think it was the right balance. It wasn't like validation for me, right? but it was encouragement. I felt like God was like, Hey, this is what I told you to do. And you see the fruit of this was that this person was blessed. And, and there's two things. This person is blessed because of it. And I'm blessed because I feel encouraged and I feel like, all right, Lord, I'm going to keep going. You know, I'm going to keep. Yeah. So yeah, there's a balance there for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for listening to uh, us kind of flesh this out. If this is something that you're interested in, if you are uh, maybe experiencing a call to ministry, you think that's what the Lord wants you to do, or if you just need to answer the call to be a Christian and to serve, um, I can't recommend the book, uh, Calling Out the Called to You Enough, and uh, and make sure that you're doing that that motivation check. Um, because I think that that's an important thing, not just when it comes to our faith, but also in other areas of life. Like, why am I taking this position? Why do I desire X, Y, and Z? Mm-hmm. Like, if, yeah. if those are the things, unholy ambition is one of the killers that's in there. Josh, you want to you wanna pray for us, man? Sure. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time uh, together that we could sit down and uh, talk through uh, some things pertaining to you, Lord. I pray that uh, it will be a, a blessing and a help to those that have listened, Lord, and uh hopefully spark some uh, searching into Mm -hmm. people's uh, motivations and what they're doing and why they're doing it. Lord, I pray that we would also continue to do that for ourselves as well as it's important and the intent behind that has a smell. Lord, I thank you uh, for the opportunity we have that you've given us. I pray you would uh, give a blessing over everyone that's listening today and uh, bring us back safely next time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for tuning in. It was great spending the morning with you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. This has been the Jesus in Jiu-Jitsu podcast, episode 072. No train.